Hello, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a great show for you this evening. Uh, Mike Bush is here. We are going to talk about Lean of Peak operations and so, so many other things happening this evening. I'd like to start with a really kind of exciting update. You know, uh, at Social Flight, uh, we operate, obviously, socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps, and these map out tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations, things to do. A lot of flying activity is actually uh, going through Social Flight, we get to see. And one of the greatest things that we're now seeing is this reawakening of general aviation uh, as we continue to move through the crisis. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's really fantastic to see there are starting to be more and more events that are actually also happening in person in addition to just uh, virtual events like this evening on Social Flight Live. Uh, and what we're seeing is they're happening with safe social distancing, procedures in place, and so I'd like to really encourage that. I think that's really important for uh, all of us to help support our industry. That is the reason that uh, for pretty much everything that I do here at Social Flight, and certainly um, the reason that we created it to begin with, uh, is to help support flying, to get everyone out there. And if we can do it safely, um, then I think it's really important that we do everything we can to support those FBOs, local restaurants, airport businesses, and everything that goes around uh, general aviation. So uh, I'd like to kick that off by saying, please check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. Look for what's happening in your local area and see if there are uh, some uh, good things that you can actually go and uh, attend uh, in person. Um, that's uh, a great thing to actually do. Another thing that I'd like to do is uh, let you know about what's upcoming now. We usually do this at the end of the show, but it's important, I think, now to give you a sense of where we're going with some of the upcoming shows. The next two weeks, we have a whole focus on aviation photography with the absolute experts that make those amazing photos you see as cover shots. Uh, the leading folks from AOPA and EAA are going to join and teach you all about uh, taking photos uh, from ground-based stuff, from air to air in the second week. Very, very cool things happening uh, with that. Um, we have Barry Schiff and uh, his son, Brian Schiff, that'll be joining us. And then um, we will also uh, be having uh, 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 Richard Van Grunsman, uh, who is, of course, the founder of Vans Aircraft. That'll be happening October 6th. So lots and lots of super, super cool things going on. But tonight we are here for Mike Bush and Lean of Peak Operations. And so um, before I kick that off, one thing I'd like to do is just give you a few tips. Obviously, uh, some people are uh, going to uh, hit the limit, as uh, we do for many of our shows. So be sure when you register to come and join early uh, when the show kicks off. In addition to that, one registration at Social Flight Live does register you for all of the shows. So every week, you're welcome to join us. Uh, and we also record our shows and make those available on Social Flight's YouTube channel. The last thing is a quick tip just about how to use the uh, program that you're using right now. You can actually change the size of the screen. You can change uh, who you're seeing larger in terms of uh, the uh, webcam. And if we show any images or anything like that along the way, um, you can move it. If you're on a mobile app, you can flip it back and forth. But there are ways to actually change this yourself for the best viewing experience possible for you. Lastly, we will be using your questions and factoring those into the evening. And so um, feel free to go in the Q&A uh, section and um, feel free to go and uh, post a question. We will either uh, directly address your question or we'll try to fit it in to what is actually what we actually face during that. You may see my eyes at times go to the side. And uh, when that happens, that's because I'm looking at questions coming in and helping do that. So. Uh, with no more uh, ado and uh, uh, preface, let's bring Mike Bush on board. Mike is arguably the best known AMP and IA in general aviation. He writes the monthly savvy maintenance column for AOPA Pilot, hosts free monthly maintenance webinars for EAA as well, and he of course is from Savvy Aviation, which he started back in 2008 to provide aircraft maintenance management, consulting services, uh, so many different things we've talked about, including uh, if you get stuck away, you need help, uh, engine monitor analysis, so many different things uh, that are great services from Savvy Aviation. 
and uh, he's been honored as a National Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year by the FAA Administrator, and with over 55 years and 8,000 hours logged in all sorts of different aircraft, I can't think of another thing to put on the list other than to say, welcome to the show again, Mike. Love it when you join us. Oh, hold on a sec. I think you're muted. There we go. You're, uh, you have to turn off your, your uh, turn on your mic, I guess. Oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yep. Thank you uh, so much for joining us. Well, th thanks. Thanks for, thanks for the introduction. Um, and, um, delighted to see we, we we max out the room here at a thousand people yeah you know uh, you we, know you're, you're, you're gonna have to up your subscription to three thousand subscriptions i am i'm gonna have soon. to keep going up here we keep we keep hitting this over and over hey i have to start by <laughs> i have to start by saying there's something going on every time you mention something with maintenance my bonanza is listening to you for some reason and and I, and I want I want you to like say something nice to it so it it doesn't just listen when it wants a cry for help or attention. So we we just got back from a tr an epic trip out to Glacier National Park, and the last time we were together, one of the things you talked about was starter adapters. <laughs> oh no! And lo and behold, while we are out there, we hear that whir as the starter goes, and the prop sort of goes and then starts. We had just mm -hmm. enough to get home, but it wor everything did work out. Um, but it seems like if you mention it, it shows up there. And I just want to do a, a shout out for anyone who does come across this. Um, we ended up connecting with Eric Anderson, the Director of Operations at Aircraft Specialty Services. Um, they are just fantastic. Yep. They make the PMA parts for these and they are in the business of people who are AOG, aircraft on ground, that need to be rescued for their starter adapters. I, I, I couldn't be happier with the response I got from them. And uh, thanks for mentioning that. Please don't mention anything else that could go wrong on my plane tonight. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, I, I am a big fan of aircraft specialty services. I use them a lot. And just in case you ever get stuck uh, away and you can't uh, get started because of a slipping starter adapter, there's a trick that you should know, and that is that that if you connect the airplane to a 20 volt, 28 volt APU or, or a 14 volt APU, depending on what, what system you've got, um, you can usually get a few more starts out of it than you can on chips battery. It's the extra voltage will, will cause the, the starter to be a little bit more aggressive and grab the drum a little bit tighter, and you can usually get a few more starts on, uh, on an APU start than you can starting on ship's battery in case you just get stuck. That but now you've, got a, now you've got a brand new starter adapter, so you're, you're good to go for that. Right, and I know that, that that's not our topic tonight, but I it, it's fascinating to me because so much of, of what uh, you teach and and so much of what I, what I have been taught uh, as an AMP and IA is there's signs for things, and you usually have time. And it seems mm -hmm. this is one of these rare maintenance events that you really don't have much time once it shows you your your number of starts seem like on a couple fingers yeah um but, but yeah i mean it gives you a little bit of warning but not too much you don't want to press it i, I know people who say oh yeah it, it twitches a little bit it takes a couple of tries and, and then they get stuck somewhere so yeah but the thing was talking to them also, Aeroshell 15W50 doesn't play nice with those starter adapters. That's good to know. Absolutely. Yeah, it, well, it fortunately, I'm, fortunately, I'm a, I'm a cam guard and Phillips guy. So yeah, I would, these, these I, things I were agree. designed back before synthetic oils, and uh, the synthetic oils tend to make them slip more uh, Got it. Than, than the dead dinosaur type oil. So let's talk Lena Peak operations. Now, you, you're an absolute expert in this area, and um, it, it seems to me that uh, we, as an industry, we still can't totally seem to get past this being a bit of a religious war of uh, should people only be flying rich of peak or is it okay for people to be flying lean of peak? Uh, specifically, of course, let's, let's start by saying engine monitors being there and, le and, and fuel injectors. How much evolution have you seen in in the market just towards how the average pilot or mechanic views flying lean of peak? 
Well, of course, there's been an enormous change. Um, my 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 good friend and the the uh, deacon of the Church of Lena Peak, uh, <laughs> uh, George Brawley, um, when he started preaching the gospel 20 years ago, roughly, uh, er everybody you know treated him as if he was total total crazy guy, and. Uh, gradually people have learned that he knew what he was talking about, which he generally does. And, um, you know, it sort of depends on the community. If you, if you look, for example, at, at Cirrus owners, almost every Cirrus pilot flies Lena P. Um, the, 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 uh, the avionics, uh, encourage you, encourage you to operate Lena Peak. The, the, you know the culture that is developed in in, in Copa, the, the the type club for Cirruses, is very pro Lena Peak, and, and so it's it's unusual to find a Cirrus owner who doesn't operate Lena Peak. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on, on on the other hand, there you know it's probably rare to find a Navion owner who flies Lena Peak. It just kind of depends on uh, on on the culture. Um, I was a very early adopter of uh, of Lena Peak operations. I had one of the very first sets of turbo gam ejectors installed in my in my Cessna Turbo 310. And um, um, I mean, I've satisfied myself that operating Lena Peak is the kindest thing you can do for the engine. Uh, and the longevity that I've gotten out of my engines is is pretty legendary. I overhauled one of them at 225% hour, uh, percent of TBO. And the wow. other one, I, I still haven't overhauled. It's still, it's still trucking along. I changed, I did a, a top on it, but uh, the bottom end hasn't, hasn't been opened up. And then it's a 1400 hour engine and the, those, those engines now have about 3,500 hours. So it, 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 clearly the engine likes it just fine. You know, the notion that you're going to, destroy the engine by operating Lena Peak is just total poppycock. It, it's, uh, you know, the, the, I think the worst offenders in this area are A&Ps <laughs> who, who tend to operate on the trailing edge a lot, that they're just very reluctant to, to adopt uh, change. And, um, and, and the irony is that, you know, you'll hear an A&P telling his clients, you know, don't, don't even think about operating Lena Peak. It'll destroy your engines and fuel is cheaper than overhauls and all of the, the stuff. And then he'll jump in his Toyota pickup truck and drive home. And of course the Toyota is operating Lena Peak because that's the only way it could pass emission standards. But, but, you know, but you're going to destroy your engine if you operate Lena Peak. It's just, you know, it's, it's, I think it's just lack of knowledge. Interesting. I mean, uh, now, now if someone's fairly new to the concept, let's say they uh, just recently purchased an, a, a more advanced aircraft or something like mm -hmm. that, what do you recommend as, what's the best way for them to come up the curve to safely doing it? Because obviously if you're going to run Lena Peak, they're, they're, you're going to pass through a danger zone. And so it is important to have some training, not just like not know anything and fumble around there. Um, what what do you recommend to a new owner of an aircraft that that's uh, that's going to start doing that? Well, I mean, to me, a, a lot of pilots, you know, sort of want cookbook answers to things, and I kind of resist that. I, I think that it's a lot better for people to understand why things ha are the way they are and to understand the principles behind them. Uh, r rather than just give them this cookbook solution and say, you know, do this and do that and you'll be okay. Um, the, and so the, you know, the articles and webinars, I've got a couple of leaning webinars that, that I've done that are on YouTube. Um, they all go into a lot of combustion theory. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll look at, at, at the various curves about what critical engine parameters are at various mixtures from ranging from very rich mixtures to extremely lean mixtures. And, and you see, for example, that the, um, the minimum detonation margin, that is the most likely place for an engine to go into detonation, 
is about 40 degrees rich of peak. That, that's the, that is the mixture at which all other things being held equal, um, peak combustion pressures are at their max, cylinder head temperature is at its max, the stress on the reciprocating components of the engine are at their max. And so it's really the place you don't want to be unless you're operating the engine at relatively low power. You know, mm -hmm. if you're running the engine at 60% power, 55% power or something, then you can put the mixture control any place you want. You're not going to hurt anything because the engine's operating at such low power that, that nothing is anywhere near the, the, the design margins. But if you're operating the engine at, at higher power, and most of us, you know, kind of want to get there quick, <laughs> um, then the thing you, we want to remember is that 40 degrees rich of peak is the worst place to be. Mm -hmm. And so we have to stay away from it. And we can stay away from it on either side. We can stay away from it on the rich side or we can stay away from it on the lean side. But we have to stay away from it. And how far away we stay away from it is kind of dependent on how much power we're, 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 we're asking the engine to put out. The higher the power, the further away we need to stay from that worst case place, the worst case place of 40 rich of peak. And of course, the irony is that if you look in a lot of pilot operating ion books, that's just about exactly where they tell you to operate, the worst place. Hmm. Um, and it's because the POHs were, you know, were mostly written back in the 60s and 70s when they didn't know any better. Mm. But when now we do know a lot better because we, we, we've, got, we've got tools that, that just didn't exist back then. We've got the ability to, to put instantaneous pressure sensors in a combustion chamber. If you go to George's test stand down in Ada, Oklahoma, um, he's got these uh, really cool tricked out spark plugs that have pressure sensors built into them and they're hooked to computers and you can watch the, 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 the instantaneous pressure in the cylinder um, in real time at, at combustion events. And then you can, you can, you can tweak things. You can change throttle and RPM and, and, and mixture and see exactly what happens to that pressure curve, how quickly it reaches peak, um, at what point relative to crankshaft rotation it reaches peak, um, and, and, and how long it takes to, to get there and how long it takes to, to, uh, to, to die down. And it, I, you know, I kind of wish every pilot had the opportunity to spend a couple of hours in that, in that test cell the way I have, because it just gives you uh, such a, 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 a a deeper understanding of what's going on inside of the combustion chamber in in very tiny periods of time measured in a few milliseconds. Um, but but it's really important to understand that. And you know one of the things that becomes very obvious is that when you run a lean mixture, um, the combustion event takes longer to play out. The the curve of, of pressure that builds up to a peak and then dies back off as the as as that pressure gets converted into into you know useful work. Um, it takes longer when you're running a lean mixture uh, because the flame front propagates more slowly in a lean mixture. Um, the the peak pressure is lower, and the curve is 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 wider. It, it, it takes a longer period of time. And so one of the things that that, the, the two things that that, that that teaches you is first of all, operating lean of peak is much gentler on the engine because the peak pressures are a lot lower. And, and the second thing it teaches you is that when you're operating a, a, a lean mixture, you need to operate at a lower RPM. And you need to operate at a lower RPM so that there is more time for that combustion event to complete before the exhaust valve opens. You know, in, in a perfect world, we would have control over the ignition timing. And if we needed a little more time for the combustion event to play out, we would just advance the ignition timing. But most of us fly, you know, behind these fixed time tractor mags. That's gradually changing. And someday we'll all be flying behind Fadex and they'll all be doing really intelligent things with the with with, with ignition timing but for the moment 
the majority of us are, are, are flying with, with fixed time magnetos. And so we don't have any way to change the mag timing, the ignition timing. We can't make the spark happen earlier to get more time for the combustion event to play out. So the only way we have to do that is to reduce the RPM, assuming that we have a controlled pitch prop. And, and that gives us more time um, uh, between the time that the spark fires and the, and the combustion event starts and the time that the exhaust valve opens. And basically anything that's left in, uh, of the combustion event gets thrown out the back door. Um, so, you know, that very basic understanding of saying that we want to stay away from 40 Richard Peak and the more power we're running, the further away we want to stay. Um, that Lena Peak um, is gentler on the engine because the, the, the peak pressures are, are significantly less, but that we need to give that combustion event more time to play out. And we do that by operating at lower RPM. If you understand that stuff, you're going to stay out of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, it to, uh, to it, and, and it, the although 40 Richard Peak is the worst place to be, to get away from that, we need to go quite far rich, or we need to go just a little lean, because the the uh, the pressures drop off very rapidly as you go lean of that peak point, but they Mike, why drop why off. Don't I open the, uh, why don't I open that slide we talked about? We'll take a look at that curve because because what you're talking okay. to here, I think would be really good for people to see. So we're gonna we're gonna post a picture here, which comes from GAMI and uh, Advanced Pilot Seminars, and this is what what is referred to, of course, as, as by a lot of people as either the red box, or the red fin graph. Um, uh, can you talk people through this a little bit? Um, well, let's see. That's 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 not actually my my favorite graph, but um, but but basically, it, what it's trying to uh, portray is uh, the area that you want to stay away from. And um, I, you know, I, I don't particularly like the how the x-axis is labeled because it's ac it, it's it's labeled in altitude as opposed which, to percent power <laughs> which should be power and and right. the reason i don't like it be labeled in altitude is because that that's only true for normally aspirated engines i fly a turbocharged oh. engine good where point. you know where, where, where it doesn't work that way so it really ought to be power uh, along the x-axis it, it, certainly in a normally aspirated engine you, you get less power as you go higher in a turbocharged engine, you don't unless you get quite high. But um, but basically, it's it if you if if you look at that kind of that red sort of sem V shaped thing on the left, that that's the area you're trying to stay out of. And the the lower the power you run, and which in this particular chart showing like at the higher altitude you are, the the skinnier that red zone is. Uh, until you get to a point where it just goes away altogether and you can put the mixture anywhere you want and it's not going to hurt anything. But as you go to higher powers, which in, in this graph is, is showing at lower altitudes, the, the this red box, this area you want to stay out of gets wider and wider. Um, the, other, the other thing I don't particularly like about this chart um, and I, I, I probably, I, if I knew you were going to put this up, I would have given you my version of the chart, which I like a lot better. Sorry, this isn't my chart in particular. Yeah, no, it's just no, one no, I was no, given. I, I understand. <laughs> but at any rate, it, it, it acts as if the red box is sort of this binary thing, that it's, it's, it's good to be out of it and terrible to be in it. And of course, that's not really the way things work. The, the deeper into the red zone you are, the more abusive it is. So I, I kind of like to draw this red box is not really a red box but a a box that's kind of yellow on the edges and red as you get to the middle and purple when you get deep inside it because the 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 deeper in inside this zone you get the the worse it is yeah um but the the, the main point is that the the, the 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 there's this area that's kind of centered around 40 richer peak this thing is showing a more like 20 richer peak but you know, I'm not going to quibble about exactly where it is. 
Um, but it, it, it gets wider and wider um, as, as power increases. And it, it gets a lot wider on the rich side than it does on the lean side, because it doesn't take a whole lot of leaning to get out of the red box, but it takes quite a lot of richening to get out of the red box. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what's uh, important to remember there. Well, let's and take this, uh, if we this take, guy if away. We take off, you know, if, if, if we're taking off uh, Richard Peak, don't normally we take off with, with all the controls forward. If it's a low density altitude airport or if it's a turbocharged engine, you do it at, 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 in all airports. But we, we typically take off Richard Peak uh, with a very, very, very rich mixture to, for, for maximum detonation margin at 100% power. And then at some point we will want to transition to Lena Peak. Most people will do that transition when they reach cruise altitude. Uh, I'm a, a little more risque, so I sometimes actually do cruise climbing Lena Peak if I'm on a field critical mission. Um, but when we want to transition from rich, richer peak to Lena Peak, we're, we're going to have to pass through the red the red box unless we reduce to very very low power. And the main thing is we want to transition through it very rapidly. Yep. So we, we, we don't want to be pulling the mixture control back really, really slowly. We want to just grab it and yank it, at what George calls the big mixture pull, and transition very quickly from Richard Peak to Lena Peak. Um, and th there are a number of ways to do that. W one is to just learn what fuel flow will get you nice, safely Lena Peak. The other is uh, when, when you pull a mixture back, um, once you get on the lean side of peak, you can feel the engine start to lose power. So, so you, you can feel it, you can hear it, you can feel it in your in your tushy. <laughs> it's it doesn't re even require instruments to to know when you're when you're lean at peak. And the main thing is to get from a, a very rich mixture to a lean at peak mixture quickly, so that you're not dawdling in the red box. And then once you're lean a peak, then you can take your time and refine it and get exactly the mixture you want. But the main thing is to get out of the through the red box as quickly as possible. Is there um, is there some some way that people can think of it in terms of how fast to go and do that? How fast to lean something? Well, if you see if you if you watch somebody who is proficient at operating lean a peak, they'll, they'll they'll typically transition through the red box in a second or so. It's it's just very quick. Um, and is that is that fast enough for most engine monitors to catch the peak? No, and that's the that's that's the uh, another important point. And, and I'm a, I may be a little heretical in this area, and I'm not sure I totally agree with the uh, APS guys in this, but um, but I recommend never using the lean find feature of an engine monitor. Um, because to use the lean find peak or the engine monitor, you have to find peak. And to find peak, because the probes have a, a, a fairly slow response time, you have to do exactly what I just said you don't want to do, which is slowly lean into the red box until you reach peak EGT. Um, I don't care where peak EGT is. I just care about being lean at peak. And I don't need an instrument to tell me that. Um, if you're obsessive about wanting to know exactly how many degrees Lena Peak you are, and I don't care, so I don't look. Um, if you, but if you feel you absolutely have to, then go Lena Peak, and then find Peak from the lean side, hmm. because because you'll be a lot less deep into the red box by doing that because you won't be passing through that purple zone you know you'll just sort of be getting to it from the from the yellow part of the of, of the red box interesting but personally i don't i don't do it at all and um uh, i don't use the lean find feature i don't use agt's leaning reference ever um because to do to use agt's leaning reference means doing exactly what we're trying to avoid doing which hmm. is dawdling inside the red box. So that's a, you know, a lot of people have spent a lot of time creating this software to, to, to do, you know, leaning and engine monitors. I just think it's a bad idea and, and I don't do it and I don't teach it that way. So does that kind of put us in a way, even with all this advanced technology, 
does, does that kind of bring us full circle to almost our, our original flight training of what you're really doing is bringing the mixture back until the engine gets a little bit rough and then bringing it forward until it smooths out? Is that, is that essentially the big pull without using an engine monitor? Well, you know, you, you, don't, you don't have to do the big pull far enough to get the engine to run rough. But, but th there's nothing wrong with that. And, and it, here's the problem with that old method. It, 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 you, it, if, you're, if I'm flying a, you know, a J3 Cub with no instrumentation, that's pretty much exactly what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to lean until the engine gets rough, and I'm going to richen just until it stops being rough. But what most students are taught, if they're taught that method, is is to lean to the onset of roughness and then rich in like three turns or four turns or something you know <laughs> Some which, is, which, which puts you right back into the red box okay because it's being taught by a flight instructor that thinks that leaning is is, is a bad thing you know um leaning to the onset of roughness and enriching just to the point where the engine starts running smooth is is a pretty good way to do it actually um but but richening much more than that right it puts you where you don't want to be so does that it, apply to fuel injected engines works, but it has to be taught correctly and and so does that apply to fuel injected engines as well not just carbureted engines when you're talking about that uh, that method of just to just back to where it's it's smooth again sure it does yeah absolutely but you know a fuel injected engine normally has some sort of instrumentation on it something in excess of 50% of the fleet now have, have some sort of a probe per cylinder engine monitor, which is, is useful. Um, you know, what I teach is that the primary leaning reference should be cylinder head temperature, not exhaust gas temperature, but cylinder head temperature. But in a perfect world, the leaning reference would be peak combustion pressure. If, if, if we all had the same tricked out spark plugs in our engines that George has in his test cell so that we could see peak combustion pressure in the cockpit, that's what we would want to use because that's really what matters. The, the, the problem is that those spark plugs aren't certified. They'll never be certified. The sensors are too expensive and they don't last very long. It's just not practical to, to put that sort of instrumentation in our engines. So the best proxy we have in the cockpit for peak combustion pressure is cylinder head temperature. Cylinder head temperature tracks pretty much along with peak combustion um, pressure. So it's, it's the best reference we have. And um, so basically the, the, the way I operate my engines is when I get ready to go lean a peak, I do a big mixture pull and get myself someplace in a nice, safe lean a peak place. Um, you can do that, as I said, by sound or by feel. I usually do it by fuel flow. I, I know in, in my particular airplane, the fuel flow gauges are calibrated in pounds per hour instead of gallons per hour. If I pull the throttles back to about 80 pounds per hour, I'm in a nice, safe lean a peak place. Um, and, and once I'm there, I can fine tune things. And how I fine tune things depends on what my objective is. If my objective is to stretch the fuel because this is a, a real fuel critical mission and I'm worried about having enough fuel at destination, then I can lean further right up until the onset of roughness. Um, if my objective is to go fast, then I can enrich it from that point until the cylinder head temperatures get up to what my maximum target is. I like to keep my cylinder head temperatures um, at 380 degrees Fahrenheit or less. So I'll, if I, if I wanna go fast, I'll, I'll enrich it until the, the hottest CHT is about 380. Mm -hmm. That was for that's for a continental. If I'm flying a Lycoming, my number would be more like 400 because Lycomings mm -hmm. tend to run about 20 degrees hotter CHT than continentals. Um, and does doing so, that uh, does does doing that protect you against that? Uh, I mean, when you get when you 
essentially are looking at your CHT and everyone, you, they set their target. You say, like you said, 380. So take, take me, I'm flying to Bonanza. I say, I'm going to lean out and then I'm going to enrich it until I, my hottest cylinder gets up to 380. That, you feel that, is that a safe place then where I'm not worried about detonation, not worried about any of the other things, simply based on watching that CHD? Yes. Now, uh, I'll, I'll make a couple of caveats to that. Um, first of all, um, I'm, I'm flying a, a legacy aircraft, a Cessna 310 that was basically designed in the, originally designed in the 50s, okay. Um, if you're flying one of these uh, relatively modern designs, like, like a Cirrus or a Columbia or a Diamond, that have these insanely efficient cooling systems, then I would drop the target down a little bit. Like, for example, we manage a lot of Cirruses. Cirruses have continental engines like mine, but they have much more efficient cooling systems. So in a Cirrus, we tend not to like to see the CHT get much above uh, about 360 rather mm -hmm. than 380, just because the cooling system is so much more effective. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the relation, you know, CHT, like I said, is the best proxy we have for peak combustion pressures. But there are other things that affect CHT besides peak combustion pressure. And one of them is how efficient the cooling system is. Another thing that affects CHT that's not peak combustion pressure is how cold the OAT is. So if, if I'm flying in very cold conditions, below ISA, I'll probably want to adjust my target down a little bit. Okay. Um, because but, again, because you're, you're more efficient on the cooling and therefore it's not as representative of a exactly. good safety margin anymore happening exactly. what's happening so, inside so you, the so cylinder. You, you want to leave yourself a little bit more margin if the outside air temperature is very cold or, or if your cooling system is very, very efficient. Right. Um, so the, those two numbers that I quoted, you know, 380 for Continental and 400 for, uh, for Lycomings, are sort of based on on how most legacy aircraft uh, are, are work, but but some of the the more modern ones uh, that have more efficient cooling systems, those numbers ought to be a little bit lower. You know what's interesting about that approach, which I really like, is uh, it actually addresses pro may, maybe almost fifty percent of the long list of questions we have coming in because so <laughs> many people are asking questions that have to do with things like. Um, you know, I don't have an engine monitor or already, uh, you know, viewing this, or I'm running, running a carbureted engine. Uh, so many things, uh, we're getting a lot of feedback that has to do with what do I do in all these simpler mm -hmm. situations? And your your approach is to a simpler approach. I mean, yeah. they, they, they still, most of them, I would assume, still have a CHT at least. Or yeah, what I mean, if, if you look at my leaning webinar, I, I start out talking about how you'd like lean a J3 Cub or a Cessna 172. And, and then I get into things that are a little more sophisticated about how you, how you, how you, how you'd lead something a little more exotic and so on and, and how you'd use better instrumentation. Um, but I always start with the simple stuff. It's mm -hmm. kind of like we're, like we're, we're talking about. Do you, do you find- well, Most um, people make this much too hard. It really isn't that complicated. Well, Most I think people a lot of, overthink it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think a lot of people really, uh, people I, I've talked to and I've gotten a lot of questions from, really want, uh, they, they, they learn enough that they get very concerned and they start looking at it and saying, this is something I want to perfect, be a perfectionist at. I want to be exactly 32 degrees rich or lean of peak or yeah. like watch exactly what it is. And you kind of look at that and they're like, Ooh, is that really the number that you're actually going to get? Uh, how accurate even is that? Because I've run many data checks, obviously, of going, going rich and then going lean and seeing, and it doesn't pick the exact same point right. every time. And, there, and there's not a right mixture. There's just not a right mixture. There's a range of acceptable mixtures. And, and there's a range of, of abusive mixtures. Mm -hmm. And we want to avoid the abusive ones. That's the most important thing. And, so is, is there any risk to, to this concept of over-leaning? Because I've, I've literally had people before, and, and this, like you said, mechanics, mechanics are always the worst offenders. And I've yeah. had them walk up to aircraft and look at the tailpipe and say, 
Now, see, that's running way too lean. I can tell looking at the tailpipe, this aircraft runs way too lean. Um, you're not going to hurt anything, you know, running very lean. The, the, the worst that can happen when you run very lean is that the engine will start running rough. Mm -hmm. uh, in which case, it's telling you. I, I'm not happy quite that lean, you know, riching me up a little bit, you know, right. and, you, and, it, and it's not let, that it hurts anything when the engine runs a little bit rough. It's just talking to you, you know, right. it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a bad thing. Um, is, is there any difference when you think about longevity of everything outside, uh, outside of that co initial like combustion mixture, uh, whether it be the valves or whether it be the, even the exhaust system, is there any, any difference in terms of a preference of, the the same uh, margin on the rich side versus the lean side uh, uh, of what it does to longevity of all those other components downstream. Well, there's a couple of different ways of looking at that. The 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 most important thing in terms of exhaust system longevity is 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 temperature. And um, you know. 50 lean a peak and 50 rich a peak are exactly the same temperature, you know? Right. So uh, there's no preference there. Um, if you're running rich a peak, the exhaust has a lot more unburned um, uh, byproducts of, 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 of the fuel, because when you're running rich a peak, what it means by definition is you have more fuel and you have oxygen to consume it. And so there's some stuff that doesn't get consumed and goes out in the exhaust and it's, it's, it, it's, it's sort of dirty and it creates deposits on things and so on. When, when you're operating Lena Peak sort of by definition is you got too much oxygen for, for, the, for the fuel. And uh, so it pretty much consumes everything in sight and, and then there's some, some oxygen left over. But there's not enough oxygen left over to 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 be noticeably corrosive. You, we 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 can't get lean enough to do that w without the engine flaming out. So, um, you know, as George says, leaner is cleaner, leaner is cooler, cooler and cleaner is better. <laughs> That's the way he looks at it. It's pretty pretty simple. I kind of like that. Um, yeah, I like that as well. Now, there's a couple other things I think are important, to, and that is. For people to understand, of course, when you're when you're all knobs in and, and you're climbing out, we're not worried about this box. You are you you're way beyond any of these margins because I think some people are concerned. What's what's my risk at that level? Uh, what's my risk when I'm when I'm just doing a hot climb, full ridge? Well, the you know the the primary risk is just getting the the cylinder head temperatures too hot. Um, but if you're running full rich, the, uh, unless the fuel system is in gross misadjustment, you, you've got tons of detonation margin. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, there are a lot of engines out there that, that are low compression engines that were, that were certified for, for 8087 or, or certified for 91 octane fuel, if anybody remembers that one. Um, and th those engines nowadays, of course, are running 100 low lead because that's all we got. And if if you're running a, a, an engine that was certified for 80 octane or 91 octane fuel on 100 low lead, there's nothing in the world you could do to make it detonate. You just you just couldn't. You know, the only right. way you can make it detonate is put some jet fuel in there. <laughs> uh, the the um, and and if you're running a a more exotic engine like I am, uh, you know, which is a, you know, a turbocharged engine. My, my engines arguably are sort of high, at high risk because they're turbocharged engines and they're not intercooled. And uh, so they're, they're, they're subject to more abuse than, than the average engine. Um, but uh, the, the, you know, the worst case place, the, the place with the minimum detonation margin, if I really wanted to put that engine into detonation intentionally in a, in a test cell or something, I, I would be setting it at around 40 rich a peak because right. that's, the, that's where I would have the best chance of getting it to detonate. Um, so if, if you're operating 250 degrees rich a peak, which is typically what, 
what you are when you're running full rich on takeoff or or if you're operating you know 20 degrees lena p you're nowhere near where where detonation could occur you don't even have to worry about it uh, right. assuming uh, unless you've got bad fuel right you know if you put jet a in the tank it's going to detonate yep. you know not, no no way around that but assuming that the fuel is is up to spec it's it's you, you, you don't have anything to worry about if you're full rich or or if you're lena p it, it just you just can't get into that nation really now the other thing i i think um i'm curious also on your feedback you know what continental says from the factory and, and the folks there uh which obviously you know know their engines is uh, that you know they specify a maximum uh continuous power and, and a maximum oper uh, continuous operating power and within that they say there's nothing you can do to make this thing detonate if you're operating within the you know uh, if, you know at or below that the maximum continuous power setting they don't say that no, uh, nobody nobody at continental would say that i thought they're talking about essentially being you know that that gives you not maximum the engine can put out maximum for those settings according to the book like when you set it up for that uh, for uh, within that, that's the maximum that you can be at safely with nothing that you can do to it. I think what they're getting at is this is giving you that 60, 65 percent, whatever it is, maximum for that scenario. Well, you know, if, if both Continental and Lycoming, if if you get the operator's manual for your engine, which most owners don't have, they have a POH for their aircraft, and most of those are are, are very unhelpful. <laughs> But if, if you get the, the operator, the Continental or Lycoming operator's manual for the engine, uh, those things have some really nice charts in them that show, that, that depict an envelope of all of the, um, the manifold pressure and RPM combinations um, in, in which the, um, in, in what, in what the manufacturer recommends as as a, as as a, a cruise envelope, and it's kind of interesting to look at those things because, for example, um, most of us were taught that we don't ever want to operate these engine over square, but if you look in in the Lycoming um, operator's manual, most most of the of the small Lycomings, Lycoming says it's okay to run those things six seven inches over square. It's right in the book. It's the way the the the, the envelope is. Uh, for Continentals, it's a little bit less than that, but but they authorize you know two to four inches over square mm -hmm. uh, in their in their envelopes, and those are very very useful. Um, th those th those are very useful graphs, and and they something like that really ought to be in our POHs, but they typically aren't. Yeah, I think those are the manuals that certainly that they're referring to that say within these envelopes you can't hurt the engine. And that's where they're kind of telling you where to operate and how much power to do at each given situation, whether it's an altitude or something like that. Um, let's take a look at some of the questions that are coming in, in our, uh, with the remaining time that we have. One of them is if you can talk to carbureted engines, and uh, in fact, in, including, of course, some of the early 310s are carbureted still. So yeah. um, how does this apply to carbureted engines? No, oh, good question. And the early 310s actually were had pressure carburetors, which is a like a words of a different color but um carburet engines are a little more challenging to operate lena peak because lena peak um uh wants good mixture distribution in other words wants all the cylinders to be operating at about the same mixture um and if the if the mixture distribution is not very good, and if some cylinders are running significantly richer than other cylinders, then the engine's gonna start to run pretty rough when you start getting into the Lena Peak area, and you won't be able to get at least very far Lena Peak. Now, most carbureted Lycomings actually have pretty good mixture distribution right out of the box. Probably not as good as a well-tuned injected engine, but they're pretty good. And they're pretty good for two reasons. One is that the Lycoming induction system for carbureted engines is pretty symmetrical. The, the carburetor is, is mounted kind of dead smack in the middle of the end, bottom of the engine. Um, and, and then the, the intake pipes come up pretty much symmetrically from that point to each of the cylinders and each of the intake ports. 
and the carburetor is bolted to the bottom of the oil pan uh, and the intake tubes run through the oil pan. So all of this air is heated, um, which makes the, the uh, fuel atomization uh, quite a bit better. The, the droplet size is smaller. Um, compare that at the other extreme with probably the worst engine to run Lena Peak that I know of, which is the, the venerable and ubiquitous 0470 Continental that, that is in Cessna 182s and some other things. Um, it, th there's an engine where the carburetor is mounted at the very rear of the engine. And the induction system is not at all symmetrical. The, the induction system um, runs the, the, the fuel air mixture forward through horizontal runner pipes that branch off into risers as they pass each cylinder. They first, first branch off to the rear cylinders and the middle cylinders and finally the front cylinders. And, and the, the, the problem with that arrangement is that the, the fuel air mixture that comes out of the carburetor is best thought of as um, air with some little tiny fuel droplets being carried along. And when that fuel air mixture gets to one of the, the risers, uh, the air doesn't have any trouble making that 90 degree turn, but the fuel wants to keep going straight. It has a hard time making the turn. So each of those, each of those branch points it, it acts as like a little centrifugal separator. Mm -hmm. It says, let's, let's let the air make the turn, but keep the fuel growing straight. And the, the net result is that the rear cylinders don't get their share of fuel. And the, the fuel that, that they don't get that keeps going straight all winds up in the front cylinder. So mm -hmm. in, if you look at an 0470, the rear cylinders always run lean. The, the front cylinders always run rich. Um, and and that makes that engine particularly difficult to operate Lena Peak because it has crummy mixture distribution. It's, it's, it's just part of the design of the engine. Yeah. Um, now there are, I've got about 4,000 hours in Skylanes, okay? And I, I love that airplane, it's a wonderful airplane. Uh, I, I certainly don't like the induction system, but most everything else about the airplane is terrific. Uh, and there are some tricks that you can use to make those engines run better uh, with lean mixtures. They're never, never going to run as well as a, an, an IO 470, but, but you, can, you can do a lot better. And, and the, the two tricks that, that, that I uh, teach the Skyline owners, one is um, to never run the engine at wide open throttle but to always retard the throttle just a little bit from wide open. And by doing that, you're tilting the, the, the throttle butterfly and you're, you're generating turbulence as the air goes through the carburetor. And that turbulence improves the mixture distribution or improves the, 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 the atomization. Mm. In, in other words, the, the droplet size is smaller and it turns the corners better. The other thing is to use a little touch of partial carb heat, which again um, improves the the atomization of the fuel, and makes makes it able to deal with those turns um, uh, with with less centrifugal separation. Interesting. The, the, you, you're still going to have the rear cylinders run lean and the front cylinders run rich, but but the difference won't be nearly as much as if you didn't do those things. Um, you know, it's a funny thing, if, 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 if you look in a J.C. Whitney catalog, you'll see that, that for, for these old uh, carbureted car engines, uh, big holly carbs and stuff, they, they sell vortex rings where, that you bolt into the throat of the carburetor. They got little veins that swirl the air as it goes through. Excuse me, I'm getting, I'm not really Italian, but I play, play it on TV. Um, but but it swirls the air as it goes through the carburetor, and, and the purpose of that is to improve the the, the mixture distribution, and improve the the atomization of the fuel. And I always thought that if somebody designed one of these vortex rings for for a Marvel Shabler carburetor, it would do wonderful things for for Skylines. But <laughs> I, nobody's done that. I, I they're, they're probably worried about the liability of what if one of those little veins breaks off and gets ingested by the engine or something. I don't know. But 
uh, any rate, that, that's the sort of thing that would really help, I think, a lot with these with the uh, with the, the carburetor engines like the 0470. But as I said, the Lycomings do pretty well because they're symmetrical, and because the air is automatically heated. You don't really need to to use partial carb heat because the the carburetor is just is bolted to this hot oil pan, and the the, the induction tubes go through the hot oil pan, so everything gets preheated. Right. I, I noticed a lot of the experimental guys are taking these light combings and putting on a cold induction system, you know, <laughs> which 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 does probably increase the horsepower a little bit, but it screws up the mix the the the, the mixture distribution in the process. So I kind of like the old way that light combing did it. Yeah, you know, you can see the difference in those light combings just based on once the engine warms up and what it's getting out of the out of, out of going through a warm oil pan versus a cold one. Yeah. 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 So another uh, another uh, group of questions that we've got coming in has to do with uh, whether uh, you also fly Lena Peak and recommend this when you're climbing, when you've got altitude changes going on, uh, and what kind of adjustment you, you do during this. Um, I don't assuming, normally I should say normally aspirated. Yeah, I don't normally teach people to climb Lena Peak. Um, it it can be done. Um, it's a lot easier in a turbocharged engine like like mine than than the, like the ones on my airplane than in a, a normally aspirated engine. Um, because a normally aspirated engine, you're constantly having to make changes to the mixture as you climb, and um, it's pretty high workload. If you climb Lena Peak, and you're not really really attentive to making these constant changes, the mixture control. The, the engine will, will will get lean enough to start running rough and stuff like that. Um, with a turbocharged engine, it's much easier because a turbocharged engine thinks it's at sea level all the time, mm -hmm. and and so it just simplifies things so much. You just just kind of set it and forget it. So right. I, I I do a lean and pleat climbs um, on on fuel critical missions. Um, the 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 rate of climb isn't as much, of course, because you you're losing some horsepower when you go lean and peak. Um, but you're saving a lot of a lot of fuel, um, and and so uh, I do it sometimes. I don't do it all the time. And for normally aspirated engines, I, I generally consider it a pretty advanced maneuver. It takes it takes a lot of attention. So as you climb, as people climb in that situation, is the mixture getting richer or getting leaner for them as they if they leave the the mixture knob alone? The the mixture will be getting richer if you leave the knob alone. Uh, so the, because, the risk of getting into the box. Exactly. You're getting less and less air as you get, get higher. So you need to pull back the red knob to get less and less fuel. And if you don't do that, that then of course, if you're startling a peak, you're going to gradually approach the, the red box. And so you have to be very attentive. Uh, now, there's also one exception to that too, which is that some aircraft, um, and notably some Bonanzas, are, are equipped with an altitude compensating fuel pump. Yep, we have that. Uh, and if you have an altitude compensating fuel pump, then it's a lot easier. It gets more like a turbocharged airplane because it 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 handles it by itself. Right. Um, but most uh, m most normally aspirated engines don't have an altitude compensating fuel pump, so it, it's up to the pilot to to be compensating as as you climb. Can you talk a little bit? You you touched earlier on uh, about the the concept that the RPM that the engine is running at is effectively uh, con, you know controlling in a secondary way the advancement uh, in a way the the rate of of what time the timing essentially of what you're able to do in the engine by giving it more time to complete the combustion. How can pilots apply that to their flying? Well, you know, as I said, um, the the when you transition from a rigid peak mixture to a lena peak mixture, part of that transition ought to be reducing RPM. Um, you know, I, I fly a twin with lever controls, and and I sort of like to think that if if I tie wrap the prop control and the mixture control together so that they moved as one, I would you'd have generally the right idea. You know. <laughs> So they they're both effectively doing the same thing. So by you're saying by you're you're slowing by by running lean peak, you're slowing down the combustion process and giving it more time to 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 take place. And by slowing down the engine, you're doing the same thing. So the goal no. is to keep 
No, no, nope. not not. But by by leaning the mixture, you're slowing down the combustion process. By reducing RPM, you're giving that combustion process more time before the exhaust valve opens and it dumps the remainder out the back door. Got so it. if you, if you run lean a peak and you don't reduce RPM, you're going to be wasting a lot of energy um, out the exhaust that you that could have been turned into useful work instead to uh, turning the prop and, and creating true airspeed, which is what we really, really want to want to create. And, you know, uh, I have another uh, lecture that I give that, that uh, about the true meaning of, of EGT and CHT. And one of the things that people don't understand is what EGT is. EGT measures the wasted energy we throw out the back door. Most people think of EGT somehow as being combustion temperature, but that's not what it is. Because during the combustion event, the exhaust valve is closed and the, and the EGT probe is on the other side of that closed exhaust valve. It doesn't see anything. If, if it were on the other side, it would be seeing temperatures like 4,000 degrees. Mm. But, it, but, but, but it's not there. It's, 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 it's outside the, the back door. And, and so what it's seeing is the energy that we're throwing away out the back door. Um, that, that's why, for example, diesel engines, which are much, much more efficient than gasoline engines because they have much higher compression ratios, have incredibly cool EGTs compared to, to gasoline right. engines because they, they convert much more of the latent energy in the fuel into actual work and throw much less of that energy out the exhaust. Um, high EGT doesn't mean you have high combustion temperatures. It means that you're wasting a lot of energy that, that you know, should have been turned into useful work. Got it. And that's recaptured, as you mentioned, by slowing down the prop if you're doing that at that by leaning. Right. It, 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 just, it just gives the, the combustion chamber, the piston and everything, more time to extract heat energy from, from the combustion gases before we throw the remainder of them out the back. Is, is the, now, of course, in a turbocharged engine, we actually recapture a little of that wasted right. energy. We, we, run, we, we, we run a compressor with it. But in a normally aspirated engine, it just gets just just pollutes the atmosphere more. <laughs> it contributes to global warming, I guess. <laughs> is is the converse side of that true as well? If someone is is not concerned about conserving fuel and and they're running on the rich side of peak for maximum power on the rich side of peak, then they want greater RPMs at that point to capture that. Um. If if you're if you're running on the rich side of peak. The, the the event completes more rapidly. The, the, the flame front burns more rapidly. It, it, it consumes everything it's going to consume more quickly, and you don't need as much time before you open the exhaust valve. So you, you can operate it at, at higher RPMs. Do you have any guidelines in general for people with, uh, let, let's say, uh, the the big continentals or even the Lycomings, like what uh, what RPMs and uh, do you tend to tell people to to you know generally operate at if they're wide open throttle? Do they do you, do you what do you cruise at? It, it, that's a little bit controversial. Um, the, for example, most of the big bore continentals, five twenties, five fifties, like that, they they have an RPM red line of twenty seven hundred that we use pretty strictly for takeoff because it expends a lot of energy generating noise because <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the prop tip speed is getting pretty close to, to Mach 1. Um, but if you ever want to hear a really nice sound, listen to a, Polon a Blanca Viking takeoff. It, it has a 300 horsepower Continental engine and for reasons known best to Giuseppe Blanca who took it to the grave with him, um, th that engine has a RP, has a takeoff red line of of twenty eight fifty instead of twenty seven hundred, <laughs> and, and it literally sounds like a chainsaw taking off. But I, I'm convinced that the difference between twenty seven twenty seven fifty twenty seven hundred and twenty eight fifty is purely noise and really no thrust to speak of. But at any rate, uh, I I digress. 
uh, normally I, I recommend uh, once you're climbing through pattern altitude and uh, that the, the, the RPM get reduced to something closer to 2,500, which is a kind of a comfortable cruise climb setting, assuming that you're operating rich at peak. And then once you're in cruise um, and, and you've decided to go lean a peak, Continental has a service bulletin that recommends not running those engines lower than 2,300. Uh, I personally feel that, that 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 recommendation should not apply to Lena Peak operation. And I have literally thousands and thousands of hours running my engines down as low as 2,100 with, with no ill effects. And when we tore the, my one engine down at 3,300 hours, um, there was no, uh, they were worried about abnormal wear on the, on the, uh, the, the, the crankshaft counterweight uh, hanger pins um, based on some problems they had with a part 121 operation back east. Um, there, was, there was no abnormal wear and I used, I, I ran my engines extensively down as low as 2100 RPM. But the difference is I was running mostly lean and peak and, and the, 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 there's such, the, the amount of of torsional um, stress on the crankshaft at, at when you're lean at peak is so much less than it is when you're running late, rich at peak that I really don't think that those that that service bulletin should apply and I choose to disregard it and as a part 91 operator I'm within my rights to disregard it <laughs> um, but but at any rate um, the, the politically correct answer is that is that the, the 2300 rpm is a good rpm for cruising those engines I personally like to to, to to run them slower than that, but but Got it. Far, far be it from me to urge somebody to violate Continental's recommendation. So 20, 2300 is the rule, Lena Peak, and uh, maybe maybe Richard Peak, you're back up to your 2500 that uh, that people are uh, yeah, uh, yeah. generally cruising at. Mm -hmm. Got it. Any thoughts for fixed pitch uh, uh, operators? Well, of course, with a fixed pitch prop, you don't you don't really have the option of controlling the the, the RPM. So you, you take what you can get and it may not be quite optimal, but you know, but it's okay. Uh, Got it. A fixed pitch prop is, is a compromise. Yeah, and uh, any, any kind of uh, guidance for the operators of turbos that are listening to you out there? Um, I'm 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 a turbocharging bigot. Uh, I I grew up in a culture back east where everybody says said oh turbocharging is a disaster and it's it's a maintenance catastrophe and you really don't need it and um, I I flew for many many years normally aspirated and um, then about 27 years ago I got my first turbocharged airplane and I I would never again buy. A normally aspirated airplane unless it was a, like a sport airplane you know like a, a, a float plane or something but if I would if if I wanted an airplane to actually travel in which is what I typically do in my airplane I, I, w I would never uh, again buy a normally aspirated airplane the utility of turbocharged airplane is just so phenomenally better and the uh, the, the maintenance cost is slightly higher but but not not uh, seriously so. Not, I, not, not brutally. So you're a big fan of, uh, as I know, George Braley and uh, Tornado Alley's work with uh, with all, all the turbo conversions that they do. Yeah, and, and I actually, we, we manage a lot of the turbo normalized uh, Cirrus SR22s that, that have the Tornado Alley conversion. And, and it's, it's just a wonderful installation. And it's absolutely remarkable what that airplane will do. Um, wow. Turbo normalized SR22 is as fast as my 310, um, with the gear down and welded in one engine. It's just amazing. It's 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 really a remarkable airplane. It's fantastic. And if well, I did we, not if I did not own my airplane and I did not have a million and a half hours of sweat equity in it, and I was buying an airplane today, that's probably what I would get. Would be an older SR22 with the with the turbo normalizing conversion on it. 
Nice. Well, maybe it's in the few cards someday for our uh, for our Bonanza. We've got a, a, a very good friend that's got one of their systems in uh, uh, on their uh, Bonanza and absolutely loves it there as well. So it's oh, a good, yeah. good fit for that. Excellent. Well, yeah. Mike, thank you so, so much for coming on the show tonight. I know that there are just hundreds of questions that we didn't get to. Um, there are so many of your webinars available online with very, very detailed information on leaning, on other maintenance stuff. And I'm hoping that uh, you will rejoin us again. I believe you're coming back uh, in uh, uh, probably a couple months to join us and we'll, um, uh, and we'll keep having you here on the show. It's always so, so much fun. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time this evening. Oh, you bet. Looking forward to the next time, Kev. Yeah. And yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm really delighted with the turnout tonight. Absolutely. We'll do everything we can to uh, to increase our base so that we can uh, uh, keep people from continuing to uh, hit the limit as everyone, uh, uh, all of this grows uh, time and time again. And so for everyone out there, again, uh, we will have a recording of tonight's presentation on Social Flight Live. That'll be available on YouTube on Social Flight's channel. Simply search for Social Flight, one word on YouTube. And then, of course, Beginning next week, we have two weeks of aviation photography, fantastic stuff that we're going to do with uh, the lead photographers and from AOPA and EAA, two different weeks, one ground-based, one air-based. And then from there, we're going to talk with uh, uh, Barry and Brian Schiff and also uh, Dick Van Grunsman of Vans Aircraft. So tons of great stuff coming uh, uh, in, in the coming weeks. And then, of course, Mike Bush will be joining us again. So Mike, thank you again. Really appreciate it and appreciate everyone from taking your time this evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon, Blue Skies.